Shum. <laughs> we have three minutes left for Sanderson's second law. Um, we may have to continue Sanderson's second law another time, but Sanderson's second law is pretty easy. Limitations are more interesting than ab abilities. What a magic can't do is usually more interesting than what it can. Okay? This is a way to start thinking about your story storytelling. Just like a character's flaws are generally more interesting than um, their strengths, what uh, the limiting factors are usually going to be the core of your magic system. Um, I divide up something um, between, between um, oh, what shall we say? <laughs> There's a lot of different ways to look at this. And I, um, I wrote an essay on it. I'm trying to remember my terminology right now. But there, there are different ways to look at For instance, there are things that we could call flaws. Um, what's that? We, there are costs and there are limitations. Um, so flaw, and I'm not sure on this terminology. I think I may have used something else in my essay. But this is something like kryptonite. Weaknesses, that's what it was, weaknesses. Um, weaknesses meaning um, something that the magic, you know, a hole in the magic, kryptonite. Right? Kryptonite is when this, mat, when this, this thing is around, it, it removes all of your powers, um, and you've got this huge hole, this huge weakness um, in your magic. Tape, magic. Um, costs are things that your magic must use in order to work. Um, you know, Dune, you have to have the spice. Uh, you don't have this stuff, you don't have FTL. No FTL, no magic, uh, no Bene Gesserit, really, uh, none of this stuff. Uh, that's an oversimplification for all you Dune fans. Um, but costs um, a, a, is the spice, or the metals in Mistborn. Um, and limitations are, um, in my terminology here, I'm just defining some terminology for you here, limitations for the magic are um, what it can and can't do. Really what it can't do. Uh, for example, again from one of my own books, uh, Mistborn, a limitation I put on the magic is that when you use the telekinesis built into the magic system, move stuff with your mind, you have to move it directly away from or towards your center of gravity. Um, and putting that limitation on the magic system actually made it far more interesting, I feel. Um, rather than having people fly, having people you know, be able to jump really far or things like this. Um, allows you to force your characters to be more innovative in the way they use their magic. Um, it allows them to have these great supernatural powers, um, yet also be hampered and limited. Of the three, this one's actually, I think, probably the least interesting, but it still works. <coughs> um, I think that the most interesting are the right limitations. Um, and using the right limitations can really make your magic system shine. Uh, using the right costs can too, but costs are really um, are, can be really tough to, to get the balance right. Yeah. Not to use another example from one of your books. Uh -huh. Where would you put Alcatraz? In this? Um, Alcatraz, I had a, um, a a material cost for lenses, um, and then I had. Um, with this limitations on um, on what the powers could do and couldn't do, they were just sim severely hampered powers. For instance, Grandpa Smedry has the power to manipulate time, um, but only in ways that make him late uh, for things. And so it's a, it's actually kind of a loose magic system. Um, but I would I would put those under limitations. Yeah, I can um, you know I I can distort matter, but really only if I'm breaking it. I can't fix things, I can only break them. Yeah? So like, in your magic systems, how do you go out and make it not seem arbitrary when you're trying to put like these details in, you're trying to make yeah. it kind of seem real, not yep. just like, mm, like, how do you make it not seem arbitrary? Yeah, that's uh, Sanderson's third law, um, which we don't have time for at all, but third law is um, everything should be interconnected. And that's why I like to talk about this after I've done all these things where we talk about culture and all this stuff. When you add magic to the mix, 
you should then take all these things that we talked about there and consider the ramifications of what your magic can do. And this is where a writer diverges from a game designer, okay? Game designers are about what's fun gameplay, not what's realistic um, as it uh, affects the world around them. D&D uh, &D is famous for this. Um, you know, if you were actually able to do, if you had wizards who could do the things that, D that they have in the D&D &D world, um, it would change the world dramatically, huge ways. But they want it to be a nice medieval fantasy role-playing game, so they just ignore all that, or they add in the, the gods won't let that happen. Um, you can turn that rock into steel, but or lead, but not gold, because the gods won't let it happen, um, and, and things like that. Um, you, um, you can make a potion worth uh, 50 gold a day, and 50 gold is like what an average person earns in a, a year, or you know, more like 10 years, and yet you're not rich. You gotta go out and adventure. Don't ask why. <laughs> don't ask why you don't just sit home and make these things and sell them all day. Um, don't ask. And What's that? There's no market. Yeah, there you go. There's no market for them. Exactly. Um, yep. And of course, that wouldn't bring the de the the, su uh, the demand the supply down and let you sell them instead. You know, because you have to have like rare griffin's feathers to make them. Why don't they then breed griffins so that all all disease is healed by this healing potion? And no, stop asking questions. <laughs> it's a fantasy game. Um, you know. Um, and that's where the difference between you and them. It's perfectly all right for that to happen because they're shooting for a certain feel for a fantasy game. Whereas you, as in writing, you, are, you don't have the game aspect. You are shooting to create a sense of immersion and realism to your story so that when people read it, they feel like it could exist. This goes particularly true for hard science fiction and epic fantasy where immersion is basically the name of the game. It feels real and that's your goal. And so make sure that you're making things interconnected. Yes? <coughs> How long do you have to think through the limitations and costs before you know that it's really good? Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, I spend a while and then I get my writing group together and say, what would this do to the world? And uh, we brainstorm it. And I try to consider those ramifications. You're not going to get them all. Just let me tell you, there are people on forums somewhere who will just say, ah, but this. Um, but as long as you're trying to take four or five steps, you know, um, rather than the, I mean, you could go on forever on these, but take a few steps, extrapolate, see how your world would change. Um, quick, easy access to food changes the world in enormous ways. And there's a zero level spell that just creates food in D&D. Um, that one thing that, you know, a cleric can do like eight times a day would like change the world would change armies, it would change warfare, it would change population centers. Um, in a matter of like 10 years, um, it would. Um, and so, yeah, um, consider these things and, and actually let you play with things. Food's one of the ones. Um, it allows me to move armies in different ways in Way of Kings because they can create food in unusual ways. So we don't have to have supply lines, which are the biggest limiting factor on your army. Um, and you know stuff like that. If you can you extrapolate just a little bit, you can have some real fun and tell interesting, unique stories.